in the world is happening on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. How are you doing there? It is David. It is the weekly podcast. This week, we're going to bring you something really quite different, which is the live show that John and I did in Vicker Street. It was a sold out gig, amazingly good fun, very vocal audience, a hoot, and we're definitely going to do it again. So here it is, myself and your man, live from Vicker Street. Let's let's kick off with this. Yeah. I want to talk to you about about the world actually. Cuz it, it feels to me like the world's going fucking mad. <laughs> like everything from from Chile, Peru, Venezuela, Bolivia, all the way over to Beirut, Iraq, Iran, there's civil unrest everywhere. Yeah. And it seems to be catching fire. And what I'm curious about is you know, I know there's different triggers for each one of those. But is there a common thread as well? Yeah, I, th- I, think, I, think, I think there is a common thread. And I mm. think it's what's, what I've been really interested in the last five or six years is that all these political shifts are movements. So Brexit is a movement. Trump is a movement. He's not part of the Republican Party. He's a yeah. movement coming out of the Tea Party. If you look at... Uh, what's happening in Hong Kong, it's a movement. Mm -hmm. The Gilets Jaunes in France, it's a movement. These are all movements. They're not political parties in the old-fashioned sense of the word. They're emerging out of one or two issues and then they're gaining traction. And the interesting thing is the bar to joining the movement is very low and the bar to leaving the movement is very low. So you can just join, you can just go on. And of course, because technology is changing everything, so you've got this very strange situation. In the old days... If you wanted to be political, you had to join the party, you had to read the book, you know, you had to read, you know, I don't know, Marx, yeah. you know, Das Kapital, and say, oh, I'm a socialist, right? And you had to agree with the creed, like going to mass. You had to say, I believe this stuff, because there was defined ideology in the political party. Now, what you don't need is any of that. So you take something like Brexit. Brexit is a feeling. It's a feeling of Britishness, it's a feeling of exclusion, it's a feeling of anger, it's a feeling that people over there are doing something to me and I can't quite identify who they are. And again, this comes back to the shifting tectonic economic plates. This is what I always believe, that once you disrupt the status quo and once economics is allowed to disrupt the status quo, all sorts of strange things materialise. So, for example, for... The, probably the most interesting period of globalization in the last 200 years was the period between about 1870 and 1910. So between 1870 and 1910, you get the m- huge opening of the American prairies. Yeah. Okay, The American prairies are open, but the problem with America is the rivers go north-south. So you can't actually trade across the Atlantic unless you build canals, yeah. which, is, which is basically after the Ice Age, the Ice dragged up, but yeah, everything yeah. went north-south except for on the equator. So if the rivers go north-south... so For years and years, America had this extraordinary agricultural potential, but they couldn't figure out how to get it out to Europe. Then, mainly Irish people built the Erie Canal. Remember we did that podcast on on Buffalo? And suddenly, in the 1860s, grain begins to come out, massively cheapened grain, out of the United States over to Europe. What that does is it undermines agricultural prices here. It drives down land prices. It drives farmers off the land. Yeah. Those farmers, this is all a shock from America. Those farmers all end up either doing one of two things, either going to the cities of Europe looking for jobs or re-migrating back out to the United States, okay? I remember we did that whole idea of the black Irish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the same time, you get this extraordinary technology called refrigeration. For me, probably the most material technological development of the 18th, the 19th century. Go on, explain that one to me. Because once you've got refrigeration, you can actually export meat from very, very, right. very okay. cheap places. Yeah. Yeah. And the first refrigerated ship left Argentina in 1871. Suddenly then Argentina and Uruguay begin 
to supply most of Europe with very, exactly what's happening now, low-cost meat. This again drives more farmers off the land. And because food prices fall in Europe, inflation falls dramatically. Inflation was low for about 60 years. But when the people end up in the cities, farmers lose their sense of place, right? Let's go back to Brexit, right? They lose, we are farming people, we are from farming stock, this is who we are, this is who my dad was, my granddad, my grandmother, this is us. They end up totally and utterly confused in urban areas, right? Exactly what's happening now. And somebody needs a narrative. Sorry, I was confused in urban areas. That's what you are, you people are. Like, we've been confused in, we were confused in suburban areas for years, right? Which is even more weird. And then, and then what you get, John, is this thing that people need a language and an idea to hang on to. So our friend Marx is hanging around in Europe in 1840. He's seen all this. He's trying to make sense of it. Marx is probably the best journalist who ever, ever wrote. An unbelievable polemicist. And well worth visiting his, 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 his birthplace in Trier in Germany and all that sort of stuff. But Marx says, look, we need to give a political expression to this feeling of restlessness that these people have. And suddenly you get an ideology. And then that ideology takes hold. And when you uproot people, you create real convulsion. So I'm always interested in, 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 in why Marx and Freud came together at the same time. Yeah. Like, you know, you have Nietzsche coming together at the same time, you have Picasso, all these modernist movements, because people are dislocated, right? And what I see right now is the same sort of huge, huge change, and we'll see it in art and culture and psychology and medicine and everything, because people need... Like all of us, everyone needs a story that makes sense so that we feel that our lives have some meaning. And if you're totally uprooted, what it does is, one, it makes you very agitated. So you go politically to the guy who says, I will protect you. Yeah. Make America great again. Take back control. Get Brexit done. Whatever the slogan is, because people lose out in disruption. So you're talking about populism here. I'm talking about populism and I'm talking about... I'm talking about where it comes from, but I, I link populism to modernism, to ideas of modernity and to ideas of confusion. And of course, the whole, the catch-all is somebody out there is doing something to me and I need protection. And therefore, I believed in this economics idea, but now I believe in more fundamental ideas of the tribe, ethnicity, yeah. the nation, the flag. So all these movements in Europe and America come back to this idea of homestead. So, so this, is, this is just a natural part of the overall cycle, the long-term cycle of, of economics. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, what, what we've, like, I mean, the, the, the economist who probably makes most sense for me is your man Schumpeter. Yeah. Okay? And his basic idea was that the economy is restless as a general idea. Mm. So most economists came and said the economy settles at equilibrium, but that's not the case, right? So if you just go out into Dublin tonight, it's a restless place, right? Yeah. It's always churning. People are opening new restaurants, new bars. They're doing their thing if they can. So there's, there's an inbuilt dynamic that good stuff emerges and bad stuff loses out. And that's Schumpeter's whole idea, which he called creative destruction. And he talked about this relentless scale of creative destruction, that basically there is a human urge to create. And that urge is what drives the economy. So the economy is never at equilibrium. It's always in a state of chassis, as Sean O'Casey would have said. And I believe that's a, quite an accurate way of understanding the right. world. Right, okay. So you take that dynamism and you superimpose upon it globalization and the shift in manufacturing work to Asia, which is absolutely the case, and I can't see that changing in Europe, although I do think Ireland can do something about it. We might talk about this maybe in the next next phase. But when you look at history, you see that relentless forces of globalization have incredibly dislocating impacts on politics. And it's kind of natural because there's always winners and losers. Like, I'm quite intrigued now by the Conservative Party in England. Yeah. So the Conservative Party in England... When we lived there for a long time, you know, this is probably not the right description, but it was, they regarded themselves as the party of the winners. If you were winning and if you were on, you know, loads yeah. of money and if you were doing well and you felt your children were going to do better than you, you voted conservative, okay? Yeah. 
And therefore, and I don't mean this in the in the the human sense, but the party of the people who lost, the party of the losers, was the Labour Party. People needed protection. They needed bigger welfare state. They needed uh, free education. They needed all sorts of welfare benefits. So the Tories, for all my life, were this party of winners. Yeah. And now you look with Brexit, right? Because Johnson has decided that he wants to hoover up Brexit voters. Brexit voters are the people who've lost out in globalization. They've lost. Yeah. Right? So the Tory party, which used to be the party of the winners, is now re-engineering itself to be a nationalist English party, taking in the people who've lost out, which means that it's going to have to be much more high tax, not low tax. It's going to have to deliver much more social welfare. If they want to hold on to their seats in the Midlands and the north of England, which it looks like they're going to get, okay? yeah. they're going to have to totally change the complexion of what they are. And this is what very manipulative political parties do. They say, okay, here's the change. We're going to be the catch-all. Mm. Well, okay? Johnson was saying that as well, that he's not going to drop the corporation tax. You know, that was always the big sales point. Of that. Yeah. He said it recently, he's going to hang on to that because that's going to fund the NHS before he sells it off. Before he sells it off, yeah. It's a core, but I mean, but I mean, then just Britain will just have to borrow a huge amount of money, which I think they will do. Yeah. And I think at the moment it's kind of crazy for countries not to borrow. For example, in this this country, I, I think we should be building infrastructure and never stop. Yeah. Once you start building big infrastructure projects, you should never stop. And because interest rates are so low at the moment, it makes complete sense. I mean, we've all seen Dublin even before the farmers arrived yesterday. You know, you get you get you get a downpour, and the place stops, right? And that's not what a proper city is about. A proper city is about getting from A to B. So I would say, John, that you know, on the one hand, globalization causes all sorts of dislocation, and I know we're going to talk about Ireland in this after the break, yeah, after everyone's yeah, had, yeah, yeah, yeah. had a pee and a few pints and everything, right? Yeah. But uh, that's very technical, <laughs> lovely, lovely image. Um, but we've done well out of it by playing a canny game. Right? My sense, though, is that populism is the political ideology of the era now in it's the, the West. Norm. I think it is the new normal. And I think it's very important for us to be really aware of that because it comes with very jagged edges. And those jagged edges can have profound impacts on a society like ours, which is going through its own internal convulsions, it just in, in terms of the changing face of Ireland. Yeah. You know? So my sense, John, is that these things are great historical sweeps. You can engineer your way out of it, actually. But like all things, small countries live and die by the quality of our strategic thinking about the world. Big countries can get away with this for a while because they're big and they've got hard power and they've got legacy and they've got population. When you're a small country like ours, John, you need to really be thinking every day about how the world is working outside yeah. and position yourself accordingly. Now, I think we can do it. Yeah. Well, listen, let's get into that a little bit more after the break. Let's, let's all have a pint. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thanks very much. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> so how are we all? <laughs> We're all liquored up, are we? Good. <laughs> <laughs> up. Always. <laughs> so, back in the day, let's go back 10 years or so. We go back much further than this. No, let's just go back 10 years or so. You were always going on about the crash. <laughs> like and a... you kind of got a bit of a name for it. And that's fine. Um, <laughs> Thanks. But tell me this. So here we are in Dublin now. How do you feel about it now? What do you, what do you think is going on? About, about our, the yeah. Irish economy? Yeah. Um, I, I think that that period, that sort of bizarre period between, let's say, 1999 and 2009, mm. and then maybe to 2014, so the, that up and, and, and down period, was just the product of really bad mismanagement. And it was actually took away from a much greater story. And the greatest story is the following. You know, again, as you know, I like to take these long historical sweeps. This country is 100 years old 
next year or the year after. And what is really extraordinary was for the first 70 years of this country's existence, we were the worst performing economy in Europe. The worst performing. Not right. the second, not the third, not the fourth, the worst. Yeah. And then something happened and we became the best performing, right? So after about 1994, 95, Ireland becomes the best performing, not on this GDP, which is a little bit, which is totally skewed by multinationals, yeah. but various different statistical ways that the ESRI and those people are trying to gauge Irish income. So if you look between 1921 and 1991, nothing happened here economically. And between 1991 and now, the economy has taken off despite the crash, despite the extraordinary... Yeah. And on almost every ma metric, this country is doing substantially better than you and I ever expected when we were kids, right? So when we were kids in, in the 80s in school, we were kind of more or less resigned to... Oh, leaving, it's, it's leaving the place and, and wanted to leave yeah. and wanted to leave as well. Yeah. I mean, emigration was not something to be feared. It was something that I thought, Jesus, we'll get to get out and see the world. So if you take that as, and I think what sometimes happens in societies, if you've had a big crash like we had, you see your frame of looking at the economy and the society is always through that crash. Yeah. But if you actually stand back and take a wee bit more altitude, what you see is unbelievably poor economic performance for 70 years, and then unbelievably strong economic, but not just economic, social and liberal performance. And what, why was the last that? 30, right? So if you, if you go and read economic history, what you always find is that there's an amazing correlation between liberalism and wealth, right? When yeah. a society becomes open, when a society becomes tolerant, when a society becomes much more accepting of dissenters, much more accepting of people who are not necessarily would not have been in the mainstream, when a society becomes less religious, less dogmatic, when it becomes less ideological, those societies grow. So there is an extraordinary and obvious link between liberalism and economic growth. And this is something that we've observed. It starts in the Dutch Republic in the early 17th century and then goes through almost all Western European societies over the last 200 years that when the society becomes tolerant, it becomes much wealthier. So I've always been obsessed by the ideas, is it that you become rich and then you get tolerant? Because as a society becomes more yeah. wealthy, it feels less, less threatened by outsiders, and then it passes tolerant legislation like gay marriage, like the abortion referendum, all those sort of things. Or is it the other way around, that actual fact tolerance drives inquiry which drives economics, because what, what makes an economy dance, right? And this economy has danced, is dissent, yeah. okay? It's open to dissent. And the reason it always struck me is that I've always believed that starting up a company is a very courageous act. I think it's an act of great courage. Yeah. I think it's an act of great creativity. I think it's it's the same as, as writing a book, you know, and I've written a few of them. Like, it's You sit in your own and you think, I'm going to do something that wasn't there before. Now, whatever that urge is, right? So you think about somebody who sets up like a coffee shop, anything, right? It doesn't have to be some highfalutin thing, right? Yeah. That What they're basically saying is, I am going to back myself in the great commercial adventure of life, right? And I am going to create something that didn't exist yesterday. And I am actually going to create a demand for something that didn't exist yesterday. So if, for example, everyone who went out and did things for themselves was waiting for a survey to tell them, do that, there's a gap in the market, right? Nothing would ever happen. Yeah. So there is a link between commercial creativity and individual creativity. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we talked on the podcast about the bizarre episode of the Volta Cinema. So the Joyce. Volta Cinema, yeah. it's actually an important date today. The Volta Cinema today, the 28th of November, is the day that James Joyce uh, in 1909 got the lease of 45... Oh, really? It's today, it's today, 45 Mary Street to set up the first cinema. James Joyce. By the way, it's now a pennies. 
shows you our I cultural was, heritage. I, I, I was wondering yeah, that actually. Exactly. Matthew, where is it Dublin matter? city of culture, <laughs> pennies. How are yeah. you anyway? But <laughs> if we were really a city of culture, we'd have preserved that, obviously. But you know, pennies pays the bills and all that stuff. Anyway, it's now the underwear department. Yeah. It's from, <laughs> stop revealing, man. You're on stage. It's not us on our Todd in the pub, right? So, but I, I've always been amazed uh, at this story about Joyce, right? So Joyce is sitting in Trieste where he's supposed to be writing his great work, but he's spending all the time in the cinema. His brother Stan is paying the bills. His brother Stan is getting very upset that Jim isn't responding to anything. They send over the younger daughter, Eva Joyce, to see on the train from Dunleary, Hollyhead, all the way to to Trieste, to see what's going on with James. And James is sitting in the cinema and he's obsessed with the cinema, Joyce's, in 1909, 1908. And because the cinema at the time was like the internet, it was like it was the new technology. It was this huge, hugely inventive, hugely expressive technology that people had never seen before. And yeah, Joyce, there, there weren't many movies around though. At that's that true, time. there weren't that many movies, but Joyce loved, it really, Joyce loved technical. He's obsessed by the sewers and how they work. Right. He's obsessed with the timetable of uh, of the trams. He was kind of quite geeky in many ways. Anyway. He would have loved uh, Silicon Valley and the whole thing then. Uh, he, if probably, he, was right he probably wouldn't have. No? I don't know. We can get into that in a sec. <laughs> okay, that, that's like the Moonies for me. Man. <laughs> that's like, but Joyce, Eva says to him one day, God, James, you spend loads of time in, in the cinema. What's that all about? She says, you know, there's no cinema in Dublin. And Joyce says, no way. And Trieste at the time had four or five cinemas and they were all doing really well. So Joyce says, okay, I'm going to come home and I'm going to set up the first cinema. And he went and he found the investors in Trieste who were investing in cinemas. He got them in a room. He put a map of Ireland out and he pointed at Cork, Dublin and Belfast. He says, there's three cities with a million people, not one cinema. And they all, and he said, we can take the country. That's his, his thing. They all, he said, fine. They said, he said, I have no money, but I want sweat equity. And he got 10% of the equity And he came home and he set it up, right? So I've always loved this story because the Volta Cinema actually closed down in 1949. I was going to ask you, how long did it last? 14, well, not Joyce didn't last that long, Mm. but the whole thing, right? (laughs) So I've always thought like, here's, it's like the portrait of the artist as a young entrepreneur, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I've always thought, what's in it, right? So if you think, and I was always intrigued in school as the people who went out on their own commercially and the people who went out on their own artistically in, 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 in... you know, mates of ours and, and, and the greater gang. And what always really struck me was there was a huge similarity between the artistic person and the commercially entrepreneurial person. Neither of them wanted the wage, neither wanted the boss. They didn't want somebody to tell them on a Monday they've got to be in work. They wanted to express themselves. They wanted to take a massive risk. And they had this urge to do something, right? So I've always thought that these two types of people are actually much closer in sentiment than we think. Yeah. And then you think, so consequently, for a society to cultivate these types of people, because people need to be dignified, people need to be offered dignity for their efforts, right? If a society sneers at the artist or the creative person, they will leave, as happened to our country. Joy Speckett, lots of people yeah. left, right? You know, because of the dogma of the church and the dogma of the state and all that sort of stuff, right? The same thing happens with creative commercial people. If you sneer at them, if you undermine them, if when somebody fails in Ireland, you say, nah, 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 look, you failed, right? If you don't give them a second chance, if you create an edifice which makes it really difficult to go out on your own, people will not do that. But if the society changes and becomes much more accepting of different types of people, much more liberal, much more tolerant, there is a commercial spark. So moral self-expression. Like when we were young, gay men and gay women could not live an open life in this society. Women that we all know went to England, good friends, close people for abortions that were always hushed up. People who weren't allowed, even divorce when we were kids, right? Yeah. There was this oppressiveness in the society. And that oppressiveness... I think, leaked into the commercial identity of the country. The people felt they shouldn't take risks because every time you fail in Ireland, whether it's morally or socially, you are 
aggressively identified as a failure. So if you link, if you accept that culture is economics, and I really believe economics is culture, and you accept that culture is data, and that the national conversation, the way we treat each other is part of the overall background noise to the economy, and I believe this is much more applicable than an investment here and an investment there. You know, what I call the building block approach to economics. I think it's a much deeper part of the cultural self-expression. Once Ireland became liberal, started to become liberal, beginning with, let's say, Mary Robinson being voted in, and then the beginning of the end of the culture wars between the church and the individual in the 1990s. After Eamon Casey. After Eamon Casey, all that sort of thing. Suddenly, you get this also percolation upwards of economic growth. So I see it. I mean, this is the, 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 it's not, it's, many people have talked about this in other countries. Few people talk about it in Ireland. And this is, you know, obviously the central idea. Poor old John, uh, this is the central idea in, in my last book, The Renaissance Nation. And because of yourselves, uh, lots of people doing the podcast said, well, why don't you actually do an audio book? And your mom says, oh man, do I have to listen to you again? Right. And so we did the audio book during the, during the year. And we, it's just like hours, that in the last hours, week, and hours, hours, hours and hours. I know. Poor. <laughs> But we got there in, we got there in the end. <laughs> but the, 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 the central idea is that Ireland's cultural change, moral change, sexual change, has had as its handmaiden a commercial change here and that commercial self-expression and individual self-expression go together. So the bigger story that I would see is not that people spent money on houses or went to, you know, the, the, uh, the taxi driver who uh, stopped me uh, in 06 and I'd made a TV documentary on, on RTE <laughs> and he had, uh, I'd gone to a cab in Dublin Airport yeah. and uh, I knew it was going to be terrifying. When the locks were on the... <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, shit. And he just looks at me and I remember he did a big net. I need the Dubs GAA jersey. <laughs> the AIG rolled over the net. It's like a big blue condom, you know? <laughs> and, I, and I'm looking at him and he's looking at me. And it's that horrible Dublin expression when he, your, man, your man says, oh, it's only our blading self. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> and he had... Uh, <laughs> you got to settle in there. Yeah, I said, okay. And he said... Uh, he didn't even ask me where I was going. <laughs> Uh, yeah. so. South Dublin. South Dublin, please. <laughs> <laughs> so <Soko-do. laughs> uh, He said, uh, "It's just this, this, you know." And he and I, he said, "Where are you after coming back?" I said, uh, "I'm from London." And he said to me, "I'm only after coming back from Kilsadasi myself." <laughs> I said, "Lovely, good for you." And he put the love up in the mirror, little stubby fingers on him. And he's looking at me, you know, he keeps looking at me in yeah. a horrible way that he's not looking yeah. anywhere else. Yeah. And he goes, I'm after buying five gaffs of plants. And I'd say, nice, interesting. And he said, top of the range. <laughs> Golf course coming in 2029. <laughs> Swimming pool. Swimming pool. Spa. The lock. <laughs> then he looks at me, he goes, Lovely people, them Greeks. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, man. <laughs> so, AIB gave him an interest-only loan. Anyway. Um, but if you, if you decide that our economic worldview should be captured by those moments, right, then you miss the really big trend, mm. which is that liberal Ireland has become wealthy Ireland, Wealthier, and a wealthier Ireland has become liberal, and these are self-reinforcing positive dynamics, and we see them in almost every country that's gone through this. And the reason we didn't go through this in the 50s and 60s and 70s was because of dogma, church dogma, and state dogma, which sneered at the individual and was obsessed with the collective. Yeah. Whether that collective be religious or industrial or manufacturing or whatever. And so once you break free of that, you release a dynamism deep inside people that wants to express themselves yeah. and have a go. And, and part of that having a go 
is becoming commercially much more more risk taking. Now, do you think it would have been possible to to do that earlier than yes, 95, 96? I, I think it would have been, but I mean, you know, the the culture war between the church and the state and the individual, the dissenting individual, mm. the person who said, I don't believe that stuff, right? That went on in Ireland from, you know, the very moment the state was founded. And that's part of our legacy. And, you know, we can say why that happened and who was responsible or whatever. It just was. But the, again, the economic consequence of dogma was lamentable economic underperformance. And it took a long, long time for that to change. But it did change. It has changed and it will continue to change. So consequently, I think, look at the really big picture. I don't see any reason for this country not to profit enormously from globalization if we do the right things. And I think that there's a tendency, humans have a tendency to let notions of the perfect bully the good, right? So when things are quite good, the easiest thing is to say, yeah, well, it's not perfect. Right? When you have a notion of perfect, it's sometimes easy to elevate that notion of perfect and denigrate the actual, we're getting, we're going in the right direction idea. So, and I think we are going in the right direction. And I believe that there are all sorts of avenues open to us as a society and as an economy to actually really do extremely well and build on the last 10 years and forget you know, what happened, the aberration. And I think it was an aberration between two, say 1998 and 2008. I think that was an aberration. So next year we have an election coming up. We do. Very soon. Yeah. And like, I'm I'm curious to know what what the key issues you think will be falling. I just want to, before we get to that, I just want to bring it back slightly to what we were talking about earlier about populism. But populism, particularly in Ireland... Yeah. Uh, I was reading a report recently from an organization called Open Democracy. And Open Democracy was this study on how much money, and they call it dark money, coming from America into Europe. And most of that money essentially was in around $50 million over the last few years. And this was coming from kind of right-wing, particularly Christian, Catholic groups, Surprise, Um, surprise. Yeah, well, there you go. But it's kind of feeding this kind of grassroots of populism and right-wing feeling. And we had, you know, the whole debacle of Verona Murray and, you know, you have Peter Casey and all the rest. But, they, you know, they funded the opening of an office of Family First. I don't know if you know who Family First are. but I can can figure out from the name. Well, there you go. But they're one of those crazy Catholic right-wing... Groups How in many America. insults are you going to give these people? Uh, but, well, here's the greatest insult. John doesn't really ha- hide his views under a bushel. Yeah, I don't have a filter, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I can Pence, tell you this stories. is the one that Pence actually is big into. These are the guys who believe yeah. in conversion but, therapy. But the for... thing, yeah, but the, you know, the, the, this Christian fundamentalist stuff, it doesn't seem to have any roots deep roots in this society. I really don't believe this. But hang on a second, the the question I was going to ask you is how safe are we from growing populism since we seem to be the only country in Europe at the moment that is not kind of, we haven't caught the Brexit disease yet. And how can we insulate ourselves from it? Look, I think, John, I I think the countries go through very, very big changes. We're going through a, a serious secular change yeah, which is which is a function of being stuck in, in a religious phase for a long, long time. I maybe I'm very naive, but when I look at Ireland, I see a very, very, very modest take up. There's no explicit anti-immigration party that's substantial here. Mm. I don't believe, and I and I see the surveys. I don't believe that there is particularly fertile ground. But more importantly, I think it's very important for us to be to fight against this 
and to be aware course, that it's there. Yeah. But, but the reason I think that Ireland now has 18% of our population is born outside of this country. If you told us in the 80s that this would happen, we would have said riots. Mm. It didn't happen. And the reason I think it is, is the economy has continued to grow. What happens when, when the economy stalls, this is when you have extraordinary dynamic forces which begin to build up because the pie, once the pie stops growing, then people gradually say, well, my side of the pie is, is, is getting smaller. Yeah. So it's absolutely imperative for us to continue to foster this growth of the economy. And once we do that, I think that ra like explicit racism is going to be a real minority sport here. I really do. I think, I think the DNA of this country has changed. I really See, think I, it has. I, I kind of worry about that. So I'm not sure if I agree with you there because... Surprise, surprise. Yeah, yeah, well, you have people like Peter Casey in the presidential elections who everyone would say, no, I wouldn't vote for him. No, no, I wouldn't yeah. do that. But having said that, he polled really well. Yeah, but... And I think, is he not a kind of a... He's an Egypt. Bubbly, well, he may well be in Egypt, but there are others. Are we waiting for... <laughs> thank you, thank you. No, no, I'm... But are we, we waiting we, for a figurehead that will should, actually I, I think it's, resonate? It's, it's, it's incumbent on us Irish people to be intolerant to this bullshit, OK? To actually call it out. I agree, absolutely. You know, and, and, to, and call it out and say, no, we're not going to have you. Mm. And we're not going to... Not because... Certain people don't feel that they have a right to express a view. That's fine. But I think we, as a society, have a responsibility to ourselves not to allow this nationalism stroke, populism stroke, racism to become a feature. And, and we can do this. We can absolutely do it. You know, because, I, I, you know, you look at the countries where populism racism has really fostered. They're largely the countries in Central Europe who feel really disjointed after yeah. the fall of the Berlin Wall. <clears throat> uh, you have it in England. You, if you look at where large parts of the Brexit vote comes from, it's, it's an anti-immigrant vote yeah. when you really scratch the surface. But again, the English middle and working class have been destroyed by their own policies over a 30-year period. I mean... You know, Mrs. Thatcher did something extraordinary. She declared war on part of her own society. This yeah. is a big deal. And obviously, if you do that, you have a very fertile ground for a type of nationalism, which Brexit is, you know, it's a, it's a sort of, I would call it kind of gobshite nationalism yeah. uh, <laughs> that you hear, sorry, it's a technical term, right? That you, that you see in the UK, it's going to lead them nowhere. It's going to lead to the breakup of their own country and Britain is going to be left, England is going to be left on its own. Yeah. And Scotland will leave. Yeah. And we've then got to deal with our own issues of the North. But, I mean, Brexit seems to me to be like England having a suicide pact with itself. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like, who's going to pull the, the cord? So, so then tell me this, then, if, if this is the new Ireland, is this new tolerant Ireland that's getting more wealthy, doing really well. Is this, is this an Ireland that's built for, for everyone or is it just uh, in the urban areas? Well, like, and tell us, yeah. like, and what's the deal with look, the kind I, of multinationals here? Okay, well, with the multinationals, I've, I've felt that there's such an opportunity, right? Yeah. That when, when I look at the multinationals and, and you look at what the deal with the multinationals is, just to do the basic figures, right? The multinationals in Ireland... Uh, make the latest figures was $120 billion profit in this country. That's from the American uh, Association. It's incredible, isn't it's, it? It's a huge amount yeah. per year. 120 odd billion, right? They're supposed to pay 12.5% tax, which means they should be paying us 16, 17 billion in and around. They're paying us nine. So 8 billion is missing. It's a lot of money, okay? Yeah. So... At the moment, it our policy... might pay for a printer in the it might dollar. Pay <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I mean, at the moment, this, mon this, this money is going, is going missing, right? And we are being 
the OECD is saying Ireland needs to go and get this money. And the multinationals are saying, well, look, hold on a second. They're trying to talk themselves a good game out of this. But I've always been intrigued the way American corporations incentivize and pay their workers. So it's a base salary plus stock options. Yeah. So if the company does well, you get this wealth, this stock options. And over time, if the country continues to do well, you actually might become really quite well off because the options yeah. will yeah. kick in and the stock's right. I've always thought, why don't we as a country look at the multinationals in Ireland the way the Norwegians looked at their oil find? The Norwegians found oil in the 1950s, and they said, OK, we are going to put this oil in a fund because it's a one-off blessing that geographically happened to happen to us, and consequently, we're not going to touch the money. Uh, other countries blew, blew the money. I've always thought, imagine Ireland if we had found oil. <laughs> <laughs> imagine like Charlie High if we'd found oil. <laughs> imagine, right? <laughs> but... <laughs> But to come back to the, the, the multinationals, so I believe we should go to the multinationals and say, look, you're paying us nine, you ought to pay us 17, there's eight in the middle. What we will do is we will do a deal with you whereby you pay us that difference between what you do and what you ought to in stock, in options. And we put that into a wealth fund. Now, can you imagine eight billion in the top American and European, but mainly American corporations across pharmaceuticals, across tech, across all sorts of yeah. areas, right? Nice okay. portfolio. Massive, right? And you let it continue to increase, yeah. right? Like the Norwegians have done. So you change the relationship between the state and the multinationals. And then what you say is, we won't use this as a pension fund. We'll use it as a startup fund. Because a pension fund, you know, like... There's no point getting paid for growing old. It's a kind of bizarre idea, right? Mm. The nub of the problem in Ireland is, is if you're in a globalised world and you have to be competitive, you have to then seed your own small businesses. But one of the major difficulties for young Irish people who want to start their business is capital. They don't have capital and they don't have collateral. But if you could imagine that a wealth fund like this growing very, very quickly and everyone has a small amount of owns a small amount of it because it's a national wealth fund. And you can use that as collateral to the banks. And you can go into the bank and say, I have this business, but I'm going to de-risk this business by giving you, by pledging you my shares in the wealth fund. So suddenly you totally change the culture of the, of the country and you completely change the way the country faces towards the globalised world. And you do a deal with the multinationals and you keep the multinationals tax money, and you get more money in, because money is really weird. Money is like water. It follows the path of least resistance. So if you create structures to allow capital and talent to come here from outside, and again, John, we're in this world of which could be called capitalism without capital. You don't need huge amounts of money to create amazing companies anymore. Like you think a company like Spotify, it doesn't have a huge amount of money. It's like an idea. So we should try and reinvent Ireland as this hub for international trade. And as the economy grows, the tax revenue grows, then we can fix things like social deprivation. Yeah. We can fix things like homelessness. We can fix the housing market with the fruits of this. And then to see the whole thing in a proper holistic sense that we're doing this. Economic growth is not important, but it's a gift that allows you to do other things. So everybody says, you know, without economic growth, you don't have medical care, you don't have education, you don't have almost everything. Basics, economic yeah. growth is the gift that allows you to create something beautiful in society. And if you can figure out a way to actually profit from all these capital flows we talked about and people moving here and there. It seems to me that a small country can do amazing things. And most interestingly, when you're small, you can shift very quickly. And all we need in Ireland, because we're small, we're, you know, we could be 7 million quite soon, we could be 7.5 million quite soon. But also, and, and that's even referring to the north as well, we're going to have to figure out how we deal 
with Northern Ireland as a political constitutional idea. And the only way we can do deal with that is if we create a country here which is exemplary in terms of how it manages itself. And it strikes me that rather than wait for the OECD or the European Commission or whoever has yeah. to tell us what to do, we should go and say, look, here's our proposal. This is what we'll do. And we'll talk to the multinationals. And you bring them in and you discuss with them and say, look, all deals are done when you want something and I want something. And there's a mutual coincidence of needs and wants. The multinationals need an exit strategy. We need a new idea. It strikes me that it's all to play for, John. It really is all yeah. to play for. And that we should never be afraid of anything. We shouldn't be scared of anything and take rules and regulations from other people. We should be able to stand up on our own two feet and say, look what we've done since 1990. We were the poorest country in the rich world in 1990. We are now a considerably wealthier, more tolerant, more liberal, nicer place to live. We have issues which I would call of transport and housing. These are management issues. These are not economic issues. Yeah, These yeah. are choices. You can fix the housing market so quickly if you decide to use rather than hoard land. Yeah. It's so obvious. Yeah, and that's frustrating. And likewise with the transport issue in this city and around the country, this is a small country, you should be able to commute from Galway to Dublin and vice versa. Yeah. Okay, these are small distances. And what we need is to have this big idea, big vision, because everything now in this globalized world is doable. And we simply have to grab it by the balls and do it. That's great, Mac. I... <laughs> Thank you. Nice one. Before we let you go, I just want to tell you of what we have on for Patreon content. It's patreon.com forward slash David Mac Williams to support us. This is the sort of thing that you will be getting. It's an amazing conversation between Johnny Ive, the man who arguably has changed our world more than almost anyone, sitting down with Stephen Fry from the Dorky Book Festival talking about the language of objects and the object of language, all moderated by Bono. Here's a clip. When the iPad came out, there was a general scepticism about the value of the product. Um, and do you remember we'd made an iPod that had the same sort of touch? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I remember being in a meeting with Stephen and somebody had said, this is OK, I suppose, but really, let's be honest, it's just a big iPod. A big iPod touch. And he said, s irritatingly quickly, well, that's like saying a swimming pool is just a large bath. <laughs> <laughs>